Hold on, hold on. Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. It's, people will start to filter in. It's fine. Yeah, we're going to give it just a few minutes for people to hop in here and get going. But you are joining the last week in mortgage today with two people in the industry that I admire very much. And we will introduce them and get started in just about 30 seconds or so as more people hop in here. So stay tuned. Amy, you didn't have any challenges with the train the other night getting home and- I did, now that you mention it. Oh no! I was totally bummed. I could have stayed exactly where I was at that dinner. Um, there was some sort of an accident on the tracks uh, ahead of Baltimore. And so it caused a delay for all trains, both northbound and southbound. So I sat in DC, you had to be on the train. So I guess I couldn't be at dinner, but um, you had to sit on the train for two hours before we got going. By the time I got home, it was midnight. Oh no, I'm sorry to hear that. Sorry to hear that. Well, I think we'll go ahead and get started here knowing that we still have people that are filtering in. Um, again, this is the last week in mortgage today. I'm Faith Howard Mooney, the VP of Member Engagement. With me today, I have Amy Azarandia, who is the SVP Mortgage Compliance um, and Systems with First Trust Bank. Thank you for joining us, Amy. And Aaron D., who is the COO of Loan People. So thanks to you, Aaron, too. We um, are going to talk today, I mean, our last week was a week spent together, which I think was absolutely fabulous, but you'll hear from the people here that matter the most about that trip. Um, so TMC did our first inaugural kind of visit to meet with the agencies in, um, in D.C., and first time that we've ever done it, we had 11 lender members um, with it, with us, and then some of our team as well. And we wanted to share with you, like, the things that were talked about, um, our impressions of being there, the people, the agencies, and all of those things. So I think that's where we'll get started. So, Erin, I'm going to start with you first. Um, I would love to just hear kind of your overall general impression of the trip and being in DC. Yeah, absolutely. I think I have to start off by just thanking uh, TMC for inviting me on this trip. I have to say I've done some really cool things in my career and this was probably the best thing I have ever done from getting to further deepen friendships and make new friendships within the collaborative and also just the opportunity to speak directly with the people that influence what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think it, we can't let this go by without saying this is why TMC is so good at what they do. Direct advocacy is something that very few of us have the opportunity to participate in, right? And it's one thing to say, hey, we partner with MBA and MBA is great. And I know that they represent us, but for us, especially since we are smaller, IMBs, community IMBs, as I am still trying to force, <laughs> I'm creating, we are CIMBs, um, community banks and kind of the smaller players in the market, it, we sometimes lose our voice. And so for us to have the opportunity to have direct advocacy is key. And I don't think there's any anything else out there like it. So it was amazing for me. And yeah, I have to agree with everything that you just said there, Erin. Absolutely. Thank you, TMC, for having us. Um, you know, Faith, like you mentioned, I think there was like 10 or 11 of us that were there. Um, I was only able to make it the one day, but you know, that was just so valuable because we were able to meet with four agencies on that one day. And each of the agencies, um, they, they rolled out the red carpet for us. We had all of your senior directors, senior staff members. Um, they even Zoomed in other staff members. And they really took everything that we were saying, every issue that we brought to the table very seriously. We were able to share our thoughts and opinions. And, and there they were, you know, taking notes. You know, Chopra, director of CFPB, taking notes, wanting to know our feedback um, our honest feedback and and help with some of the solutioning with some of the problems that, you know, not just an, an IMB or a CIMB is dealing with or a bank is dealing with, but us as a mortgage industry together are dealing with collectively. And for that, that opportunity was amazing for me. 
Well, I was so impressed by a number of things. And one was you guys. I mean, it was great to see our lender members in that environment and ask some really tough questions of people, but in the politest manner that can possibly be done and get some answers back. So I was very impressed by that. And then the other thing I think I was impressed by, and we talked about this a little bit before we started the show, is we had people from all different aspects of the TMC family. And we um, put together a group of people that meshed together beautifully, but some didn't know each other very well. So it allowed you to have some new and different contacts with people in the network that also are heavily involved in advocacy in some of their states and interested in it. So I'm hoping that everybody that was involved met some new friends um, and people that you can go to within the network. So it makes our hearts really happy here to hear that type of commentary. I would be remiss if I didn't mention before we moved forward into the individual meetings, um, that Amy Bohr, who is in the background of this call, coordinated all of those meetings with us and made it look so effortless when we all know that that is not the case. So, um, Amy, we appreciate you very, very much. So I think with that, we'll get started and move into the first um, people that we met with were um, Mark McCardle, um, who is the assistant director at the CFPB, and we got to spend 30 minutes with Rohit which I think, I mean, his assistant, we won no awards with her as she was wanting to get him out of the room. Um, but I would just love to hear the, your takeaways from that particular meeting. Um, Amy, you want to start? Uh, where, do, where do we go? Um, actually, no. Go, Erin. Oh, start. okay. <laughs> <laughs> fair, fair, fair. I like to hear myself talk. Um, so, so, yeah, I mean, I think just 30 minutes with Rohit was amazing. And he kicked off the meeting talking about it's the disparity between the, the guys at the very, very top and all of us who are here day to day helping out our communities and that they're really looking for ways to help us have be, uh, have more of an advantage and that the big guys have an unfair and they really want to kind of level that playing field for us. You know, you always you never know, you know, when you're talking to a politician or somebody in the, that political sphere, you know, you never really know how much to believe. But he was very believable to me. Um, you know, I feel like I have good spidey senses and, and, and I was really impressed with just how he kicked off the meeting. He was very interested in, in asking us what we were seeing. So for me, the kind of three big takeaways that I had was one is we had a very real conversation about the impact of trigger leads and what that is doing for, for us. That was a very big topic and it's on their radar and, and we got to talk to them about how it really impacts us. The other thing that we talked about was LO comp rules and an acknowledgement of kind of the world in which LO comp rules came about really doesn't exist anymore. And we really need to look at modernizing those. And, and to that end, they're actually asked us to put together uh, basically a draft proposal or, or recommendation for changes that can be made. And myself, Tim Pasquarella, um, with Melissa, I believe we're going to be working on that uh, Thursday. So we're really excited about that. And, and I was honestly just unsure if they were just telling us that to appease us. Um, but Mark McArdle actually followed up with us yesterday to make sure that we knew that we were working on it and that we knew that they were looking forward to hearing it. So, so that was really big. And then the third big takeaway was just talking about their focus on fintech companies and understanding that, you know, there's a few kind of fintech players sort of bubbling to the top that are really kind of price gouging and, and, and what that's doing specifically in, in harming the smaller players who don't have that economy of skill. Um, so that was also really great to hear them. We also talked about broker compensation and how, you know, brokers are able to leverage borrow paid compensation to skirt around some rules when we, in the LO comp space. Um, and finally, the thing, the small, the thing that stood out to me that I liked is they're working on amending the ATR rule to permit streamlined refis on Fannie Freddie loans um, in anticipation of refis coming when, when rates go back down. So those are my big, exciting takeaways. Yep. Amy, you have anything that you want to add in on that meeting? Yeah, we also talked a little bit about, you know, just the cost of FICO and maybe some of the other cost um, issues surrounding our industry. For example, like the D1C and uh, work number, um, they are not happy with work number. I think one of the quotes of the day was, you know, a company that uh, can give you inaccurate information and then charge you not once but twice for the inaccurate information. Uh, and they're looking at ways to solve some of those problems. Um, like Aaron mentioned, you know, they were taking us very seriously and they want to make sure that we are 
are sending them in our feedback. Uh, one of the things that we learned is that it's really important when they're making policy, they need to defend where they came up with these ideas. You know, it's okay to have these meetings and to talk about it verbally, but you really need to back it up with something in writing that they can point to down the line should anybody ever question why they made a certain policy change. Uh, it's really good to have that industry feedback. And that was something that we learned while yeah. we were there. Yeah, that's great observation there. How about, um, because we have a limited amount of time, um, how about Ginny May? That was our next meeting of the morning with Elena McCargo and her whole um, executive team was She's there. She's a beast. She's just an absolute beast. <laughs> Lots of props for Elena. She uh, is just a fantastic, brilliant woman that I know I truly enjoyed meeting. Um, our bank doesn't have a Ginny ticket. And we talked about some of the challenges in getting that Ginny ticket. And I think when we when it came down to it, you know, counterparty risk is really important. And those hurdles are there for a reason. Um, you know, it's really important that, you know, you're showing liquidity and that, you know, should the economy take a downturn, that you can handle those investor payments. Um, so we talked a lot about counterparty risk, housing supply. We talked about the industry at large. Um, it was a fantastic meeting. Yeah, she was, I thought, very, very impressive. I was very impressed by her. Um, one of the things that I noticed when I was in the room, because I tended to just sit back and listen to, or listen to you guys talk, was I think one of the things that I was kind of hopeful from there that maybe they'll do something with is the two-year servicing manager requirement in your organization. Because while her um, employee was defending that, I also saw her writing notes down about that. So that was one of the things I observed. Erin, how about you? Yeah, actually, I thought that was interesting. One of the attendees said that she finally got her Ginny ticket after her third application and the longtime employee's response was, well, we actually consider that a success rate. Yeah. <laughs> and it felt like maybe you could see a little bit of pull between like the appointed and the long-term employee. That's right. so that was just an interesting dynamic I kind of noticed. Um, I think the only two other things that um, I really picked up on there was one was discussing their CDFI, the Community Development Financial Institution Initiative, and is there a pathway through TMC for us to potentially create some advantages for our members? I know we talked about discussing that further, so hopefully more to come on that. Um, the other was, um, uh, oh, they're looking at utilizing the FHLB from an, as an aggregator for IMBs or CIMBs as well to where um, we would be able to leverage FHLB at, um, uh, as an aggregator, which I think is something we all really want. They also acknowledged kind of the unfair advantage that financial institutions can have over IMBs. And so how can they help with that? Um, I believe we also discussed that uh, potential delinquency rates now as, as mortgage rates are going up and some alternatives to that. And the day after they actually released something uh, that, or I believe HUD released something talking about doing partial uh, partial payments. So that was really cool. We actually kind of got to see like policy in motion while we were meeting with them as well. Yep. So one of the other things that stood out before we move on to the next meeting, you know, when she was speaking, she, she, something that's not really in the news or media very often, she said, you know, we need to make sure that our policies across all the housing industry are aligned. And that comes from Joe Biden himself, you know, and, and whatever your politics are, I thought it was interesting that, you know, from the top down, our president is talking to these housing industries and saying, you need to collaborate. And you don't just have to collaborate and meet more often, which they are for the first time, but you also have to share data. And we found out when the, in the Ginny meeting that for the first time, Ginny is now receiving and able to work with FHA data. They have trillions in issuance and they didn't have data on the loans that are backing up those issuance until now. Yeah. So I think that's pretty interesting think, to see that changing. Yeah, that was surprising to me as well. And I think that, um, I think it was Director Thompson that also mentioned that yes. fact of everybody needs to be on the same page. So it was interesting that you heard it like a couple of different In places. every meeting. Yeah, that you know that, you know. It came that from that. on high, we have to get together. We have to collaborate. Yep, yep. Um, next meeting, we were at HUD um, with Sarah Edelman and the team there at HUD. 
So um, would love to hear, you know, takeaways that you had from that meeting. Uh, yeah, if you want, I can I can kick that one off. So um, first of all, the HUD building, I could never work in that building. It was, they called it what a nine-story basement. I could, yep. I could never work in that in that building. Um, so a few things. So we touched on um, possible changes to their QC policy. Is it is there a potential pathway to not require a field review on 10% of the files given the costs of that? And that also goes back to data sharing. And they said, you know, one of the reasons that Fannie and Freddie were able to move to doing the 100% desk reviews because they have a lot of data from collateral underwriter and all of that. And so you know, they said they've been working for years with Fannie and Freddie trying to get data and information shared. So, so it's definitely a problem that that came up multiple times. Um, so we talked through that. Uh, we also talked about uh, the credit model changes that Fannie and Freddie are working on. You know, again, going back to the data sharing issues where you know Fannie and Freddie are looking to make these changes, but FHA, VA, USDA they have not made a decision. They're not on board with those changes. So if Fannie Freddie have one scoring model or one system, then, and, you know, FHA, VA, USDA are on a different one. Those are significant operational challenges. And so, you know, again, we kind of stress the urgency of, of needing to be able to, to have clarity on what we're doing from a credit score perspective. Um, and then we also talked about the rental self-sufficiency guidelines and, you know, do we, is that appropriate? We do have a DTI that we fall back on as well. They did say that they're, they're working, uh, they're relooking at that also. So those are my key takeaways from the, the HUD meeting. I think we also talked about the reinspection. And is there something that we can do with reinspections? Uh, for example, you know, could we use some of the technology that's out there today where the homeowner can take those pictures to prove uh, that the work has been completed when it's um, a subject to appraisal? And uh, we talked through some of that. We also talked about um, the changes that were made to the dual employment. Oh, yes. <laughs> 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 and what's that, what, what is that uh, causing in our industry? And, and I think the most important thing that I learned at, at that piece is, you know, I wanted to know the impetus of why this rule was changed after it's, it, it was a rule forever. It was, it was always an FHA rule. They were the gatekeeper. So why did it all of a sudden change in December? And we found out that it was actually because it was number one on the MBA white paper. Yeah. Yep. Unintended and consequences. So here was one organization that was, um, you know, politicking to have the requirement changed, and they did without really understanding the consequences. And and I don't know if it's necessarily a bad consequence or a good consequence, but I do know that it is changing the way that uh, we're operating, and doing business today. Yeah. 100%. And I think we also talked about the helper act. I know that was, that was one that's coming down to potentially allow hundred percent financing for firefighters, nurses, teachers, things like that. Yep. We did. We did. Um, and the news there that we got that, um, it looks like consumers for those may need to bring some dollars to the table, but not anything in a down payment and that, that they are working on it. The other thing that I was impressed by this meeting is there were a couple of the things that you guys just talked about that they wanted write-ups on, on yes. what people felt were important. So I think, you know, overall for all of the meetings that we had while we were there, um, they definitely are trying to listen to people that are in the trenches daily um, so I was very impressed that they wanted to hear more and they wanted more detail and they wanted ideas um, of how, you know, easier ways that, that they, that we thought that they could implement um, things or different options for implementation to cover them. So, yeah. Um, so then we moved on. Our last meeting of the day was with director, director Sandra Thompson, who, um, I, absolutely, Amy. I mean, who doesn't, I mean, what person in our industry would not want to be like her? She was the most delightful, charming individual who just gave it to us really straight. And um, she did not come with an entourage of other people. She came by herself, um, which I was just, I mean, every single time I think I meet her or I'm around her, I am more and more impressed. 
So would kind of love to hear like feedback. I mean, were you guys feeling the exact same thing? It kind of seems like you were. <laughs> One of the things I thought were really cool. She said, you know, I received your, uh, you know, your agenda, your list, and you have a lot on the list. And I have some other things that I want to share with you. We only have 45 minutes, but you know, we're just going to roll up our sleeves and it's just going to take however long it takes. We're going to get through it all. Yeah. And that's who she is. Yeah, I agree. She was just, she was open, honest, and, uh, you know, was just, I, that was my favorite meeting of the day, I would have to say. I mean, the, the meeting with Rohit was just amazing in the sense of like meeting with the director, but she, in, in, in her own right, she's just so great and forthright. And you can tell it just wants to be a partner to all of us. Right. We talked about conservatorship. We talked about, um, you know, what are the biggest challenge there? What, what's the number one issue? Wow. You know, that implicit and explicit guarantee from the government. And what does that do to the secondary market and keeping that balance? Mm -hmm. um, we talked a lot about the price adjustments and how that relates to the capital requirements and the impetus of that and why it changed and how it changed. Um, she never liked the DTI LPA for the record. <laughs> she never liked it. <laughs> my faith is restored I like it. <laughs> well I love how she spent so much time just digging into the media coverage and like with you know saying that we're, that good borrowers are subsidizing you know lower income higher DTI borrowers and how that just wasn't true and really what they were doing was removing a built-in fee for MI because they're essentially right. making people pay double for MI and you know getting to hear kind of her her backstory behind that was really enlightening as well uh, you know, we talked about, uh, you know, they have special, the special purpose credit programs that, you know, a lot of the larger lenders have been able to, to work on with them. And, and what can we do for, again, smaller lenders to try to have similar advantages? We definitely brought up repurchases and what we were all seeing there. She wasn't really surprised that we were, you know, we were bringing that up. And so we just kind of ran a few examples by her that, you know, what we were seeing and really calling into question, you know, does the rep and warrant framework even exist? There were examples of, you know, loans that should have fallen under the rep and warrant framework and they were still calling for repurchases. And once we get into the Friday meeting, we can talk more to them specifically, but just kind of giving her a high level overview of kind of the the perception that we're seeing in the industry of them going even harder on repurchases. And, you know, it feels almost like they're trying to, you know, get additional capital to make up for some of these, you know, some of the, the LLPA cuts that they've done. And, and absent any other news, you know, we're left free to our own <laughs> devices and conclusions. And so, you know, shared that with her as well. My favorite thing from this meeting, number one, this probably was my favorite meeting of the day too, but it's strictly because of the person that ran the meeting in the manner that they did, um, All because all information from all meetings was great. But my favorite thing was that she asked, um, are smaller to mid-sized lenders having problems competing with larger ones? And she wanted to know whether it was just banks or whether it was IMBs and banks. And um, you know, it's, it, she was obviously looking for some feedback there. And I thought for the people that we support within the TMC family, that was like the greatest, I mean, whether she intended that or not, but that was like the greatest question to ask for the group of right. lend members that she had in front of her. Right. We want um, a level playing field when it comes to G fees, you know, you don't want the bigger banks to have some sort of advantage. And she was really interested in that. Yeah. Um, you know, she also yeah, talked about the you know, she, she had sent out a directive to both GSEs um, talking about meeting their goals. You know, she doesn't necessarily want the GSEs calling us and saying, you got to send us X percentage of, uh, you know, LMI um, yeah. transactions. She just wants it to happen organically. She also yeah. doesn't want them to purchase it, you know, which may also makes sense because it needs to come through the agencies organically. It needs to be new money. It needs to be real. Yeah, a hundred percent. And, you know, sometimes it was almost like she was like a, a mom, like having to like corral her kids, which is so cute. Like, I love her. Um, you know, and the last thing that we really talked about with her was, you know, it can't be formal because of bylaws and blah, 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 but, you know, having the ability for groups like us. And I think this is something that we at TMC should take back and, and, and continue to be as proactive as possible in providing feedback. Like we did with the, with the, the DTI LLPA, 
is is they need is is having informal groups of lenders of really all sizes before they roll something out to talk about how it impacts us. You know, we talked about how the hybrid appraisal rollout. We were like, "What? This really doesn't do anything. Like, just give us back, you know, just give us back external, you know, exterior only." Give us our PIW. It's way better, right? <laughs> right. So, you know, and we kind of just went through a, a couple of things where you know it was like they didn't think through how it impacts the people who are there on the daily. And so I think that just goes to show that like what TMC did with the DTI LPA is the right. And we need to continue to do that where when things come out, like, hey, let's talk about it. Yeah, I agree with that. And um, it was interesting for me as a person that sometimes is involved in like getting lender members together and organizing things to hear they weren't that they were totally open to hearing from lenders and they wanted to. But to organize something formally, that was a big learn for me for this trip. To organize, for them to organize something formally has to go through so much red tape that they would rather have it just be casual. And they were so willing to meet in that manner. So that was something that I learned about DC is like that formal thing is just really hard, hard for them Informal. to Informal. I mean, they'll roll it out. You know, yeah. once you get through security, which can take 40 minutes. <laughs> And the security is 30 lesson. minutes each time alone. <laughs> Another learning lesson from our trip. Security does take a time frame. And, you know, if Tim Pascarella ever listens to this, you absolutely do need your driver's license. So <laughs> yeah, don't pull a Tim. <laughs> lessons learned from the first trip. So last uh, meeting that we had was with Freddie. Um, and so Aaron would love to kind of hear you know, your thoughts and impressions while we were in that great big Freddy building and nobody comes in on Fridays, which was another thing that we learned. Yeah, it felt like zombie land apocalypse or something. It was so weird. And, and here's the thing, with the exception of HUD and also Ginny, like these buildings were big, palatial, gorgeous, our tax dollars at work, like they're beautiful buildings. Freddie, you know, they, the building was great. They apparently closed the office on Mondays and Fridays. So the people that met with, that we met with Kevin Kaufman and his team, um, it was actually really cool of them because they came in on a Friday when they normally wouldn't have to. So that was great. Um, obviously repurchases came up as the first topic with Freddie. Um, you know, they insist that they have not changed their review percentages. It's just that we originated so much in 2020 and 2021 that it's just the sheer volume of reviews and that they were behind and they are getting caught up. Um, one thing they said that they implemented as of June 1st was that now anytime uh, a QC reviewer is going to recommend repurchase that now has to go through a second review according to his numbers, he said that would that will reduce the number of repurchase requests by 10% off the top. So, you know, where that actual number lies, that's great news. We were super pumped about it. They've hired a new head of QC who is supposed to come in and make some, some pretty good changes. Apparently there's some like things to come in the next few weeks from Freddie Mac on the QC front. So we were really, really excited about that. They're looking at the materiality of defects and is that can that really be, you know, is it something that truly hits the level of a repurchase, looking at what they call alternatives to repurchase, which, you know, you know, is it in, an indemnification? So, you know, that's one thing that they're, you know, we're trying to, to put back on the table. And then for those of us who sell, you know, we sell the majority of our loans to aggregators, only 10 to 15 goes direct. And so, you know, if we get a repurchase request, I brought up, hey, are we able to, we should be able to ne negotiate with you guys directly instead of just going through a middleman who's going to wait two to three weeks to send us the repurchase request. It cuts down on our, our ability to work on this. Um, and they said they have no problems with us going direct, but they have to work with their counterparty. Yeah. So they told us to reach out to our aggregators and ask that we can communicate with them directly. So please do that. They said, not only are they okay with it, they encourage it. So just a little something for you guys to, to put on the back burner. Um, let's see, uh, we also talked to them about um, aligning with Fannie Mae for when you can run LPA post-closing. Uh, right now it's only 60 days and it makes it challenging, obviously, you know, post-closing to be able to make changes. So that person that runs their systems was there and they are looking at that to see where they can make those changes to, to loosen up on that timeframe a little bit. We talked about, you know, 
again, back to having data verification providers and how expensive they are. And, you know, they said they're, they're working with multiple providers and, you know, we suggested that they actually get something out to all of us to say, Hey, who can we work with for what they have a partnership with core logic with their income calculator that will go live and uh, live update LPA. Um, when you are running the core logic income calculator, along with loan beam. And I apologize. There was one other one. I, I forgot. Um, we also talked about, and this is super cool. Um, they went into a lot of different data about affordability and um, she sent the slides earlier today so we can get those out. But um, they're gonna have a database for down payment assistance programs by state to where what they said is you can go in and enter parameters of the loan and it'll pull up, hey, these are all of the different potential DPA loans that you could qualify for. They're gonna roll it in Texas and Michigan first and then slowly add other stage. That sounded like a super cool ad. So excited to see what that looks like. Um, I'm sure there are definitely um, some things that I, I missed. I'm sure Kate or, or Mike will, will, will kind of kick me in the shins for missing a few important topics, but those are really kind of the, the big ones. Texas and Minnesota, not Michigan. <laughs> oh, my bad. <laughs> Sorry, I only heard Texas and then I stopped listening. <laughs> So you and I together, our two states. Um, yeah. Um, Bernard, I don't know the rollout of those. They did not have a time frame, but um, once, as soon as we hear it, we will um, make sure and kind of share more information out with the group. They did not give us a time frame, but it sounded like it was relatively soon. Imminent, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so should hear or see more on that um, soon. So we are right at the bottom of the hour. Appreciate you both immensely. Yes. Um, it was fantastic to be in person with you and others um, during this trip. And um, we are glad, makes our hearts happy here that um, the trip went as well as it did. And we got answers on questions for some of you and the rest of the people that are in the TMC family as well. So appreciate you both. Thanks for doing this with me today. Thank you. And we thank you and everyone at TMC. 100%. Thank you. We will be back with the last week in mortgage today, tomorrow, or tomorrow, next week, <laughs> same time, same place. Thanks, ladies. Bye. Thank yeah. you.